Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today here in Sturm Hall and on Zoom. I am Rhonda Gonzalez, the Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, or CAUSE, as we say here. I am delighted to welcome you to our annual Harper Distinguished Speaker Series. Every year we invite an innovative leader from a liberal arts field to join us here at CAUSE to discuss topics relevant to their work, to our community, and to the times we are living in now. This event is always a highlight of our year, and this year is no exception. I'm thrilled to have Nicole Seymour here with us tonight. Dr. Seymour is an Associate Professor of English and Graduate Advisor for Environmental Studies at California State University, Fullerton. She works at the intersection of environmental studies and queer studies with a particular focus on the role of aesthetics and affects. She is the author of Strange Natures, Futurity, Empathy, and Queer Ecological Imagination, the Queer Ecological Imagination, which won the 2015 Book Award for Ecocriticism and the Association from the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment. She also wrote, Bad Environmentalism, Irony and Irreverence in the Ecological Age, which was included in the Chicago Review of Books list of the best, best nature writing in 2018. Her newest book, Glitter, we'll all remember that one, offers an environmental cultural history of a substance often dismissed as frivolous. Dr. Seymour recently held fellowships at the Rachel Carson Center for Environmental Environment and Society in Munich and the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Edinburgh. Before we begin the lecture, I just have a few reminders for the audience. This lecture is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube and social media channels. After Dr. Seymour's talk, we will have a moderated Q&A session followed by questions from the audience. So I encourage you all to think of any questions you might want to ask throughout the evening. With that, I would like to introduce our moderator for this evening. Erica, would you just stand to let everyone know? An associate professor and director of internships in our Department of Media, Film and Journalism Studies. Please join me in welcoming Erica. Thank you, Dean Gonzalez. Um, again, I am Erica Polson from the Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies. And our department actually has four different undergraduate majors. Uh, we have journalism studies, film studies and production, strategic communication, and media studies. And this year, for the first time, we decided that we would come up with one theme that the capstone course in each of those majors would focus on for that course. And the capstone course is of course the chance for those majors to do a really applied project for the whole quarter. Um, and this year we chose climate change in Colorado to be our theme. So I was very excited to hear that uh, Nicole Seymour would be our speaker tonight and that climate change would be uh, a part of it. So even though we uh, are officially here for the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, it's also fun to see how Nicole's um, talk, Dr. Seymour's talk, weaves in with so many other things that we're doing on campus. And of course, this is also one of the culminating events for our Earth Week um, activities that have been going on all week, right? And I think are continuing in the next couple of days. Um, so today, Dr. Seymour, Seymour will draw from her book, Bad Environmentalism, uh, among other sources, to draw parallels between the ongoing climate crisis and emerging developments in modern activism and comedy, and their implications on the future of bad environmentalism. I'm really looking forward to this talk. Please welcome me, help, please help me in welcoming Dr. Nicole Seymour to the Harper Distinguished Lecture Series. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, it is, this is my first time in Denver or Colorado at all. Um, so thanks for <laughs> having me. Um, I understand that we are on Cheyenne and Arapaho land. Um, 
I want to first thank um, Jake Jensen and Tyler McKnight for all their planning and organizing help, as well as Dean Stanton, Dean Gonzalez, Erica Polson, and whoever else. I'm sure there are many other people that I don't know uh, who works behind the scenes to make this possible. So, um, okay, let's get started. Um, oops. Oh, yes. Okay. Message for virtual audience members. Um, please, this is the first time I've seen this slide. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible. Um, and I guess we already said this, this is being recorded, so behave yourselves. All right. Okay, so the title of my talk is Climate Crisis and Comedy Crisis. And everyone likes a roadmap, and here is mine. So I will first start out by thinking about um, comedy as a possible solution to some issues and problems around the environment. And then we'll take a swerve and talk about comedy as a problem. And then that's where the, the crisis, comedy crisis part of my title comes in. And then, um, so I'll be talking about doubts around the efficacy of comedy as well as its misuses and abuses. And then part three is where do we go from here um, to give us at least <laughs> a, a positive note to end on uh, knowing all of the above. I should also say that the word comedy is kind of doing a lot of heavy lifting here. So sometimes I'll actually be talking about um, forms of humor um, that might be like satire or absurdism or irony, but um, just like everyone likes a roadmap, everyone likes alliteration. So I decided to go with climate crisis and comedy crisis. All right. Um, one last thing to acknowledge before I really get into this is that um, sections of part two and three um, were developed in collaboration with um, some co-authors. So on the left is Darren DeWitt, who is a political scientist at Cal State Long Beach, and that is his dog. He looks cute, but he's evil. Um, and on the right is a glamour shot of Anthony Luoy, who is an English um, uh, and liberal arts professor at Juilliard. Um, so as I've progressed in my career, I've basically gotten to the point where I just want to do interdisciplinary collaboration because I learned so much from other people and it's a lot more fun than working by yourself. So I will try to signpost when um, one of those two folks were contributing. All right. Um, so part one, comedy as solution. So as um, Erica mentioned, I will be drawing on this book. That's my friend's dog, Jackie, modeling bad environmentalism. Um, so I did publish it a few years ago, um, but it's still, I hope it's still relevant in the ways that you'll see, but um, also some things have changed since I published it, as you'll see. So one of the foundational premises of this book is the longstanding, arguably cliched, but often all too accurate view in the global north of environmentalists as unfun, unfunny, gloomy, and doomy killjoys. In fact, were we to catalog uh, the, the affects and sensibilities typically associated with mainstream environmentalism, many of us would probably add things like guilt, shame, didacticism, prescriptiveness, sentimentality, reverence, seriousness, sincerity, earnestness, wonder, sanctimony, self-righteousness, and certitude. I don't know why there's so many S words um, related to this, but the, but there are. And here I'm talking again about mainstream environmentalism. So your, your um, World Wild, Wildlife Federation, um, your natural, uh, sorry, National Resources Defense Sorry, Natural Resources Defense Council. I'm not talking about like main uh, uh, grassroots environmental justice organizations, for example. Um, okay. Um, depending on our powers of perception, we might also notice that the movement is overwhelmingly straight and white. Uh, at the same time, absurdities and ironies abound when it comes to environmental issues. Absurdities and ironies that prove humorous on some level, even if our laughter is rather bitter. For example, eco-critic uh, Frederick Buell has described how environmental crisis has become normalized as part of everyday life. The word crisis comes from the Greek for decision or turning point, but knowledge of the climate crisis has not really led to such a thing, at least not in the United States. Meanwhile, sociologist Kari Norgard has found that in many cases, the more one knows about environmental crisis, the less likely one is to act, which again is very ironic. Um, and if you need a brief refresher, the Oxford English Dictionary says that ironic describes a situation, event, or outcome that is cruelly, humorously, and or strangely at odds with assumptions or expectations. As environmental studies scholar Sarah Jaquette Ray recently argued in her excellent book, A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, How to Keep Your Cool on a Warming Planet, quote, it's astonishing, or I would personally say ironic, that so many climate change activists still rely on the sky is falling approach to getting people to care. Perhaps they think that heralding the end will propel more listeners to action and thereby help us avoid that end. But cognitively, it doesn't work that way, or at least it won't in the long term. The bigger the problem, the less fixable it seems, and so the more likely we are to do nothing instead of something. Um, so, oops, sorry, gone, gone too far. 
Um, it should be acknowledged, of course, that some of the aforementioned scenarios may look ironic only from certain vantage points. As environmental crisis disproportionately affects already marginalized groups, crisis is actually rather expected in a depressing way for some. So there's, um, I'm not trying to say that there's something ironic or funny, for example, about the brutalization of indigenous pipeline protesters. But even so, an ironic worldview often seems most apt in such cases of injustice. As Potawatomi philosopher Kyle Powis White dryly argues, quote, climate injustice for indigenous peoples is less about the specter of a new future and more like the experience of deja vu, given the forced migration and adaptation to new climates that colonization has brought about. So the ironic twist there about climate change is that it's actually not a twist in the grand scheme of world history. Or consider how political theorist Brandon Terry has identified, quote, an ironic discourse in civil rights history, perhaps best encapsulated by the phrase, the more things change, the more this, they stay the same, end quote. Terry recounts how civil rights figures such as Derrick Bell engaged with the absurdist work of Albert Camus, of all people, as they highlighted, quote, the need for struggle even in the face of certain defeat, end quote. That is to say, civil rights activists maintained an ironic worldview, a darkly humorous one, something that we might paraphrase as, fighting won't work, let's keep fighting. Struggle, in other words, has multiple functions and goals other than victory per se, including building community and preserving dignity under domination. And I'll circle back to this point in, in just a minute, um, but to ex uh, finish explaining the book for those who are not familiar, um, bad environmentalism draws attention to contemporary works from the global north that both identify and respond to those aforementioned absurdities and ironies through absurdism and irony themselves, as well as related affects and senti senti sorry, <laughs> sentiments, sensibilities, such as irreverence, ambivalence, camp, frivolity, humor, indecorum, awkwardness, sardonicism, perversity, playfulness, and glee. Yes, I like a list. Um, <laughs> these works feature environmentalist impulses, but demonstrate none of those affective hallmarks of environmentalism that we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, so by bad here, I mean um, not bad as in negative per se, but um, inappropriate or seemingly inappropriate for, for the context. Um, moreover, these works often display self-reflexivity and self-consciousness, as opposed to the sometimes single-minded self-righteousness of mainstream environmentalism. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples here. Um, so top left, uh, hopefully you can all see this in the back, it's a sign that says, Save the Straits, Oh, and the Planet Too. Uh, this is a group called Queers for the Climate that participated in the People's Climate March a few years ago. Um, so obviously the idea meaning that um, the majority of people on the planet are straight, so <laughs> we've got to save them. Uh, so we've got to save the planet. Um, and then bottom left is um, a sketch, uh, a comedy sketch from a troupe called the 1491s, an indigenous group, get it, 1491s, okay. Um, and it's the title of the, the sketch is Pipeline Protest, and these um, activists have mistaken what is actually a carnival ride for an extraction machine, so they go to um, protest that. And then on the right, um, if anyone's ever seen Jackass, um, there was a spinoff of Jackass called Wild Boys, um, where these, uh, it's it's basically a nature program parody. So um, these guys would, um, you know, go to different countries and um, tie raw meat to their butts and then um, have a hyena chase them and try to eat them and things like that. Um, and so it's, it's making fun of the very you know, straight laced, you know, hushed tones like, ah, here's the mongoose in his native habitat or whatever, you know, so making fun of those types of programs. But the, I, in the book, I talk about how you actually can learn things about the environment, about nature when you watch this show. Um, just a couple more examples on the left is Nuclear Waste uh, from Colorado, actually a drag queen who uh, talks about nuclear toxicity. And on the right, uh, this one is a little complicated. Um, but this is a group of people who were um, asking the Tate Museum in London to divest from British Petroleum, who had been um, supporting them financially. Um, and the idea, so they're dressed as mermaids. Um, and on the right, bottom right, this person is holding the sign that says 2060, London will be ours. And so the idea is that climate change, fossil fuels from, you know, like BP, cause climate change, climate change causes rising sea levels. And so the joke there is that like mermaids are like loving climate change and loving BP because soon they will own the cities because they can swim in them. Okay, so maybe too many layers there, but uh, you get the idea. 
Okay, so the striking difference of these works, I argue, in here is not just in the tenor of their affect, but also its structure. I show, for example, how irony's conceptual doubling, so you say one thing, but you mean another, you say you want BP to sink the city, but actually you are working to mitigate sea level rise, uh, allows it to disrupt the binarized logic of despair versus hope so central to contemporary environmental discourse. These works are proposing an ironic worldview rather than one that gives up in despair or is naively hopeful. Irony also allows these works to dispute mainstream environmentalism's claims to authenticity, urgency, and straightforwardness, which are claims that often exclude people of color and queer folks. So here's one example of what I mean. Um, this is a, a recent letter of resignation from an environmentalist named Richard W. Halsey, who runs the California Chaparral Institute, and he is giving up his membership in the Sierra Club after 52 years. Um, so as I mentioned, um, you know, things like World Wildlife Federation and Natural Resources De Defense Council, I think of those as mainstream environmental organizations. And up until recently, the Sierra Club, um, what I, I would say was a mainstream environmentalist organization, um, but they recently started trying to pivot to the kind of attention to inequality that um, grassroots environmental justice organizations have modeled. And it hasn't gone over super well, at least not in this guy's opinion. Um, he, uh, so he does not like that the club's new core values uh, lead with a commitment to shifting power away from white supremacy, repairing harm, and ending structural racism. Many of us, I don't know you, uh, but many of us would say, sounds good to me. He says, no, thank you. Uh, the club's mission to protect the environment unfortunately continues to be increasingly diluted by its new social justice focus, end quote. So the claim there is that climate change and conservation are the real issues at hand, whereas identity politics or social justice are a distraction or at best something to get to later, even though we know, for instance, that people of color and queer people actually suffer more than others from climate catastrophes, as scholars such as Leo Goldsmith and Vanessa Raditz and Mike Mendes have shown. Um, and even though we know that gender normativity, for example, is literally killing the planet, as Kara Daggett has shown with her concept of petromasculinity. I can talk about that later, but I think you get, <laughs> you get it. Um, so not surprisingly, then, I find that bad environmentalism, as opposed to mainstream environmentalism, is practiced frequently, though definitely not exclusively, by LGBTQ+, non-white and or working class cultural producers. I trace this practice across multiple media forms and genres, um, so I think you got a sense of that earlier, I'm, you know, looking at TV, looking at sketch comedy, um, so animation, documentary, fiction film, uh, performance art, poetry, what have I forgotten, prose, prose fiction, <laughs> sketch, uh, stand-up comedy, and visual art since the 1970s. Um, because these works don't demonstrate those affective hallmarks um, I was mentioning, uh, so seriousness and sentimentality, et cetera, they've historically been ignored by other eco-critics, um, you know, other people in my field and um, environmental humanists. So part of my contribution is to acknowledge them, sorry, let me go back, uh, acknowledge them and to claim them as environmentalist texts. And kind of related to that, the, the book, this is the last thing I'll, I'll say, um, bad environmentalism features a significant metacritical component, meaning I reflect on the tendencies and oversights of my own fields of eco-criticism and the environmental humanities. For example, I question environmental humanists' tendency to judge artworks primarily by their capacity to educate the public or inspire measurable action. Um, and this is where I circle back to that civil rights discussion. I demonstrate how a less strictly environmentalist approach allows us to imagine different or additional capacities for environmental art and discourse beyond those narrowly defined victories of immediate education or measurable action. And these capacities include enacting catharsis, bearing witness, raising activist morale, refusing obligatory responses to disaster. This next one is super optimistic, mitigating the partisan divide over environmental issues, and inspiring artful endurance. Um, so the, the dream there, my dream is that the book models a criticism that is non-instrumentalist and open to the multiple possibilities of cultural works. Um, it's also trying to diversify the archive of environmentalist art and reassess how that archive is constituted in the first place. And if that was too jargony, I'll kind of sum it all up and say, um, the book suggests that comedy writ large is a solution or at least an alternative to the incessant gloom and doom and exclusivity that has dominated environmental art, activism, and discourse for decades. 
But, oh no, that sounded great, right? You're like, I'll buy it. It's already in my in my cart. Okay. Um, so um, since I finished this book, I've begun to recognize in many progressive corners a general disillusionment or even guilt about embracing comedy, humor, and satire in particular. I've also noticed many palpable shifts in the deployment of comedic modes along partisan political lines. And again, I definitely I stand behind the book. You should definitely read it. Um, but the, the overall picture has gotten much more complicated than I could have imagined when I first started working on it. So I'm going to sketch out that complicated um, picture in this section, starting with disillusionment. In 2015, speaking about his satirical climate change themed novel, The Subprimes, U.S. author Carl Tyro Greenfeld told the Los Angeles Times, quote, I worry real life will eclipse this book very quickly, end quote. The subprimes details a future Southern California world in which corporations such as Subway sponsor elementary schools. So the protagonist's kid goes to the Subway Eat Fresh John Adams Middle School, um, and in which climate change and habitat destruction have led to an explosion in the coyote population, such that joggers have to carry mace around them uh, with them at all times. And I'll give you two instances of how I've actually experienced this um, eclipse of <laughs> real life eclipsing the book uh, since I first taught it. Um, so first, I recently learned that Amazon now gives scholarships to students at our university. So we're at least a little bit on our way to becoming Amazon Prime California University, State University Fullerton. I ruined that joke. Okay. Um, <laughs> Amazon Prime California State University Fullerton. Second, coyote warning signs started popping up all over campus after the first time I taught this novel. Um, they were not there when I got to campus eight years ago. Um, and in fact, um, I was running um, a late night. Um, students were presenting their master's project. Um, we have an arboretum and we have a classroom in the arboretum and we had to close the doors because the, the terrifying cries of the coyotes were drowning out the students. So anyway, um, yeah, so <laughs> things have gotten real. Um, to take another more recent example of a supposedly eclipsed text, um, in 2021, the high profile climate change uh, satire slash disaster film, Don't Look Up, which um, I, I guess the screenwriter was on campus last night. So maybe some of you saw the film or have seen it on Netflix. Um, so uh, it was blasted by critics on the left and the right, notably for what they called its smugness. So that was from Baltimore Magazine. Uh, its lack of subtlety, that was from Rolling Stone and how it preached to the choir. So that was from NPR. Um, I don't actually know anything about Baltimore Magazine, but I do know Rolling Stone and NPR and those are very leftist um, outlets, right? So it's not that um, it was, the, the reaction was across the board um, politically. Um, in short, it seems that environmental um, and other crises are deepening at such a rapid pace that artists and satirists in particular are finding that their artistic imaginations are being outstripped, or at least that's the concern. Similar, similar musings have recently circulated around comedy, humor, and satire more broadly, not just as regards environmentally themed texts. These musings speak to a growing sense that there is no place or purpose for such heightened or absurdist modes in an already absurd landscape defined, at least in the global north, by the surreally outsized personality of former President Donald Trump and the bonkers theories of QAnon. For instance, journalist Allison Herman has identified, uh, this is in 2020, she identified, quote, a problem that so much Trump era comedy and art in general is unable to solve how hard it is to come up with something, anything funnier or stranger or more shocking than what's already unfolding on our current news and social media feeds. As she, <laughs> I hear people murmuring, it's true. Um, as, as she uh, sums it up, comedians are currently struggling to heighten the heightened. And we'll just pause for a second. And everyone likes definitions in case you're like, uh-oh, I missed this on the, the vocab quiz in high school. Um, satire is a representation or representation of certain realities in exaggerated or, and the or is important here, we'll come back to that, or bizarre ways with the purpose of critiquing said reality. Um, and we, we often think of satire as humorous, um, but it doesn't, doesn't have to be. Okay. Um, to fully grasp how much has changed in just a short span of time, consider that in 2014, scholars Sophia McLennan and Remy Maisel published a book titled, Is Satire Saving Our Nation? Defining satire, so basically they say yes, they define satire as a form of salvation and argue that the mode helps, quote, citizens identify and effectively respond to recent crises in our democracy. 
But just one year um, before this, actually, um, Carl Terrell Greenfeld was expressing those doubts as to satire's efficacy. Um, so the, the timeline is kind of getting wonky here. Um, and just a year after that, uh, with an eye toward the threats to democracy that Donald Trump posed, scholar Maggie Hennefeld asked in a Flow Journal article, quote, to what extent are comedy and laughter responsible for enabling Trump's rise amid a pathologically entertaining political media landscape, end quote. And part of the idea there is that uh, liberal satirists and comedians, let's say like John Oliver, spent their pre-election time mocking Trump uh, for laughs and or finding him to be laughable in and of him himself, thereby failing to take seriously his potential to win and therefore drastically change the course of political history. Meanwhile, uh, the satirical and comedic news programs that once dominated the cable landscape, uh, cable television landscape, now appear to be at least somewhat on the wane. Samantha Bee's full frontal was canceled in July 2020, and Trevor Noah tendered his resignation from The Daily Show about six months ago. If leftist or progressive satire is waning, at least a little bit, is conservative humor rising to fill the vacuum? And the short answer is yes. And here's what, where I'll turn to my research with um, Darren DeWitt. We're working on an article for the Oxford Handbook of Screen Comedy titled Satirical Liberals and Superior Conservatives, colon, the asymmetry of US political humor, and we find two notable things. First, humor studies as a field has been largely inattentive to cons conservative humor, in part because of its own liberal bias, but also specifically because of its bias towards satire in particular. So that's to say liberal academics have idealized political satire, guilty as charged, um, because uh, they, they just think that's sort of like the best way to do things. And then when they have found it largely missing on the right, so basically they've gone looking for conservative satire and said, well, it doesn't exist. Therefore, they've jumped to conclusions like liberals love to laugh, conservatives not so much, which is not true. Okay, we, we that's not true. Okay, um, and we can talk about this more in Q&A. This is an article that was reporting on a book um, called Irony and Outrage that looks at the difference in, in humor um, preferences for humor amongst conservatives and liberals. And the book itself is definitely onto something, but the way it was reported in the media was incredibly uh, simplistic. Meanwhile, liberal academics have either ignored other types of humor that do crop up amongst conservative content creators, including so-called trolling and punching down, or declare them to be not funny, despite the fact that many people do find them funny. The second thing Dr. DeWitt and I find is that whereas ideologically extreme conservative humor was once hidden in the back channels, it has been increasingly breaking out of its bubble over the last 15 years or so. Um, and I should say that um, we're not the only scholars to talk about this. Um, definitely other people um, have started writing about this recently. Um, perhaps this is something you've noticed as well. Maybe you've noticed more um, extreme humor circulating in your social media feeds. Um, I'll just give you one example from the beginning of that, that time period. In 2011, Republican Central Committee member Marilyn Davenport circulated to her acquaintances a family-style portrait image of apes with Barack Obama's face superimposed on one of them with text reading, now you know why no birth certificate. Several major outlets shared the story as well as the image in question which they certainly didn't have to, right? They could have reported on the story without showing the image. Davenport, who refused to step do down, responded, quote, I'm sorry if my email offended anyone. I simply found it amusing regarding the character of Obama and the questions surrounding his origin. In no way did I even consider the fact that he's half black, end quote. Davenport's dubious denial of racism aside, what's important here is that this instance of humor was circulated much more widely than it would have been in previous eras reaching racists as well as anti-racists and those in between. Why was this the case? You guys can probably guess. Um, we point to a couple of factors, including the relatively recent 24-hour news cycle in which even the most objectionable content can be deemed newsworthy. Um, and we also point to the unique qualities of the meme as a form. Uh, regarding the latter, scholars Patrick Davidson and Hannah Bost have argued that the anonymity of the meme form, that's to say because memes are not you know, signed or otherwise credited to one person or group, quote, enables a type of freedom from regulation and punishment, particularly for transgressive material, while the lack of attribution encourages circulation. The obvious lack of, the lack of obvious authorship can nudge far-right ideas into the mainstream, end quote. As Davidson and Boast hint, humor provides 
a form of defense, or what William Chang has called a ludic alibi. We saw that in Davenport's uh, response, I simply found it amusing, right? She says, I, I circulated the meme I, because I simply found it amusing. And we've also seen this um, defense uh, many times since around extreme uh, humor. For example, in 2016, after Fox News commentator Jesse Waters produced a stereotype-filled segment of his Waters World show in New York's Chinatown, he tweeted in response to the ensue, I can't talk today, sorry, the ensuing furor, quote, the segment was intended to be a light piece, as all Waters World segments are, end quote. This sounds awfully familiar to the leaked style guide for the Daily Stormer, a white supremacist message board, which included instructions such as, quote, when using racial slurs, it should come across as half joking, like a racist joke that everyone laughs at because it's true. The reader is at first drawn in by curiosity or the naughty humor, end quote. Such attempts or hypothetical attempts at humor obviously constitute instances of punching down, um, which I, as I hinted at later, is a move that liberals and liberal scholars don't tend to find funny. So this is a famous um, tweet from Mark Marin, the comedian and podcast, podcast host, 13.7 um, million likes. Um, if you can't punch up, sorry, thousand likes, not million. Uh, if you can't punch up, punch sideways or punch yourself in the face over and over, both tried and true comedy approaches. Um, so just what people define as Humor, where the right kind of humor depends on political lines. All that said, there's one very surprising juncture at which left-wing and right-wing humor practices have been converging, and that's around, or at least I think this is what's happening, and that's around the aesthetics of drag and camp. I've been particularly attuned to this because I discussed those aesthetics um, extensively in bad environmentalism. So you saw um, the, the drag queens, you saw the mermaids, um, there's actually a whole crop of green queens, um, green drag queens. Um, there's uh, someone named, uh, we, we already talked about nuclear waste. There's someone named Seema the Vegan, Tammy Brown, Lady Bunny, and this is Patagonia. Um, got it? Yeah. Um, she is the backpacking drag queen. So very like Colorado style, but she's I don't think she's actually from Colorado. Um, and of course, there's a long history of LGBTQ plus environmental activism, which is something I talk about um, in my first book. But before 2020, I never dreamed that we would see a Republican presidential candidate dancing to the village people's gay anthem YMCA throughout his campaign rallies. And I certainly missed in the year before bad environmentalism came out, right wing conspiracy theorist Alex Jones dressing up like a frog to advance the idea that people are putting chemicals in the water to, quote, make the friggin frogs gay. I cannot explain this. It is real, but I cannot explain it. Um, so definitely, uh, some interesting quasi environmentalist rhetoric there, right? Like some fears about toxicity, um, pollution, and I'm going to say definitely some form of drag. Uh, it's all too much to get into at this moment. Um, or consider the recent revelation that Tennessee governor Bill Lee, who just signed the so-called anti-drag ban or drag ban, uh, bill in March, 2023 had himself dressed in drag in high school. One almost starts to wonder if conservative politicians want to criminalize drag and camp, not because they want to eradicate them per se, but so they can keep it for themselves. And this is actually, um, I said it, I said it. Um, this is actually going to be <laughs> the topic of my next research project because I really, it's, it's mind bending to me to think about um, th this kind of um, extreme white supremacist um, and other um, engagement with humorous LGBTQ plus subcultural modes, but that's, it's definitely happening. So we need to. I need to talk about it. Okay, so to sum things up for this section, liberal satirists and audiences alike have recently lost faith in the effectiveness of comedic modes such as satire, at least as we know it, to address environmental and other problems. Meanwhile, ideologically extreme folks on the right have recently appropriated comedic modes such as, uh, such as memes and camp and have also used comedy as an alibi, leading to a relative normalization of white supremacist ideas. So it's a pretty weird and fraught moment, and therefore, we have to ask, where do we go from here? And the we here is um, pretty expansive. So I'm going to talk about scholars as well as uh, comedians and viewers, um, as you'll see. OK, so uh, the first thing on the scholar tip, uh, Darren DeWitt and I discuss in our article the need for more research on conservative humor and on the mainstreaming of ideologically extreme humor in particular. Um, and I should acknowledge, I mentioned this briefly, There's um, 
a handful of people working on this topic. Um, so for example, uh, Matt Sinkowitz and Nick Marks have a great book titled That's Not Funny, How the Right Makes Comedy Work for Them. And Raul Perez has a book called The Souls of White Jokes, How Racist Humor, <laughs> that's good, right? Um, how Racist Humor Fuels White Supremacy. Um, but this kind of scholarship is literally only just now coming out. So both of those books came out last year. And in the introduction to um, That's Not Funny, um, the authors talk about how when they tell their like partners and friends and colleagues that they're working on conservative humor, the first thing people say is, there's no such thing. Um, and then the second thing people say is, well, it's not funny. Uh, right. So and the whole point that they're trying to make that I'm trying to make uh, is someone does think it's funny. OK, so <laughs> we can't really deny that anymore. Um, OK, so there's a longstanding gap and much more to be done. And as uh, Darren DeWitt, DeWitt and I argue, fluctuations in humor connect to fluctuations in media and political infrastructures, which means that paying attention to the first allows us to understand the second and vice versa. On the comedian tip, Satirists might innovate their way around the problems Herman and others have identified. And here's where um, I'll draw my work with um, Anthony Luoy from a forthcoming essay titled Eco-Political Satire in the Global North, which will appear in the Rutledge Handbook of Eco-Media Studies. One of the figures we look at is US comedian Sarah Cooper, who rocketed to attention in 2020 thanks to her TikTok videos. We're just gonna watch a brief clip here. Hopefully this works. Um, we did get a cord, right? Yeah, we got an argument. Okay. I don't want to give trillions and trillions of dollars. I don't want to lose millions and millions of jobs. I don't want to be put at a disadvantage. I wish you could go to Greenland, uh, watch these huge chunks of ice just falling into the ocean, raising the sea levels. And you don't know whether or not that would have happened with or without man. You don't know? Well, you're scientists. You're scientists at no, NOAA and NASA. No, we have, we have scientists that disagree with that. You know, I, I was thinking, what if he said, no, I've seen the hurricane situations. I've changed my mind. There really is climate change. And I thought, wow, what an impact. What an impact well, that denying, would make. I'm not denying climate change but it could very well go back. You know, we're talking about well, all <laughs> so, um, so the the audio there is from, you know, who's 60 Minutes interview with Les Leslie Stahl in relation to his Paris, uh, Paris, sorry, Paris Climate Accords withdrawal. And if you guys remember, this is the interview that he walked out on. So this is <laughs> right before he left the building. Um, as Dr. Leoy and I discuss, Cooper's juxt juxtaposition of her black female body with the words of our racist, sexist former president repositions those words as particularly absurd and bizarre. She critiques him humorously without resorting to caricaturing or costuming, for example, and thereby sidesteps entirely Herman's question of how to heighten the already heightened. So she actually changes nothing about the original words or delivery, right? She's not exaggerating anything. This is verbatim. Um, so we do read this as satire, but as a kind that doesn't rely on the classic hallmark of heightening or exaggeration. Um, and just, let's see. Okay. Um, and I'm going to show, oh, oh, and so, yeah, so we see her as taking the root of the bizarre rather than the root of the exaggerated. Okay. Um, for some reason, the flood is not changing. I don't want nope, to do. not again. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, this is another example that we found um, from a group uh, called The Juice, um, which is an Australian um, satirical group. And um, interestingly enough, they also use um, lip syncing, but I don't think they, they know Cooper or related to her at all. So let's watch a little bit of this. Hello, I'm from the government with an update on how we're handling the climate crisis. We know you're all counting on us to solve this problem so humanity can keep enjoying its favorite pastime, continuing to live on this planet. But you see, we've realized that we are the problem. And so how should we put this? We're actually going to get us all killed. Look at this graph shaped like a penis because it shows how fucked we are. This is where we are coming. And as we can see, it's already pretty fucked with massive fires, floods, heat waves, Locus bullshit. This is what scientists call the stop here or we're fucked point. And this is where we're currently headed, or as scientists call it, net fucked by 2050. The good news is we've promised to reduce our emissions. And if you take all our promises and add them together, that puts us on track for still very much fucked by 2050. And that's if we keep our promises. A big if, since some of our biggest promises are being coke blocked by corporate coal shills, while others are nothing more than blah, 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 or a plan printed 
printed on a pamphlet. Pamphlet. Our promises and pamphlets are also based on the hope that we'll. It's pretty subtle, but did you guys notice that the 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 audio and the video don't actually sync up? So there's a couple moments where she stops talking and the audio keeps going, or or vice versa. Um, So we don't have that gendered or racial juxtaposition that that we see with Cooper. she slips thinking to herself, as I understand it, that the um, the actress is the one with the audio track. Um, but I think the two satirical performances have the same effect of giving the viewers kind of an uncanny sense of something being off with the official script, right? Something's not right here, literally, but also figuratively. So something that citizens might investigate and take action on themselves. So those previous examples are about innovation, um, but another option in the where do we go from here uh, question might be to just embrace the time-honored act oh, of, I'm nope, so sorry, gotten, <laughs> clearly, it's just too good, um, clearly, I can do this, I can do this, here we go, okay, um, that's what I wanted, yes, yes, yes. sorry guys, PhD in English, not in IT, okay, um, so, Um, we suggest, or I suggest that maybe we embrace the time-honored tradition of preaching to the choir. Um, I'll explain this by returning to Don't Look Up. Um, This is something that Dr. Luoy and I discuss in our essay. Um, So first, a quick plot summary for those of you who did not watch it last night. Um, The film stars Leonardo DiCaprio as astronomer Randall Mindy and Jennifer Lawrence here on the screen as his grad student Kate DiBiaschi, who respectively discover and then confirm that a comet is heading toward Earth, spelling imminent destruction. Or is it an asteroid? I actually can't remember. It's an asteroid. Thank you. Okay. Again, PhD in English. Okay. Um, But their warnings go largely unheeded and the asteroid becomes a political football, therefore allowing it to serve as an obvious analogy for climate change, as well as COVID-19 and possibly other issues. As I mentioned earlier, the film was critiqued on both sides of the political spectrum for being smug and insular. But we see it as having potential for catharsis on behalf of activists and scientists alike, As in such moments when she screams, Dibieski screams on live television to smug audiences primed for infotainment, are we not being clear we're all 100% for sure going to fucking die, end quote. Climate scientist Peter Kalmus, in a Guardian opinion piece titled, I'm a climate scientist, don't look up, captures the madness I see every day, relates that the moment Dibieski screams is the moment he felt a connection to his lived experience. So he says, this is the first time I actually felt seen in a movie, like anyone got (laughs) what my life was like. Um, Likewise, there's a Netflix mini documentary on YouTube titled Scientists and Experts React to Don't Look Up, which indicates that the film, again, resonated deeply with um, such people who we should note often struggle with burnout, depression, and even PTSD due both to their work itself and the ways that we like to ignore it. If a satirical film can give a climate scientist or activist a little comic relief or entertainment in the midst of all that, perhaps we can forgive its arguable smugness or insularity. Um, Our line of thinking here is um, inspired by humor studies scholar Danielle Fuentes Morgan's recent book on African-American satire, which is titled Laughing to Keep from Dying, a play, of course, on the phrase laughing to keep from crying. Fuentes Morgan has argued that, quote, inspiring, knowing in group laughter opens up Black interior space that wards off psychic or even physical death. Preaching to the choir, as Fuentes Morgan would have it, is not frivolous, but in fact necessary for the choir's survival. So again, you can see that our approach is open to the many possibilities of cultural texts beyond the instrumentalist and the immediate. Will Sarah Cooper or Don't Look Up solve the climate crisis? Obviously not, but they might make the day of someone who is directly working to do so. As Dr. Leoy and I argue in our article, art can diagnose the trouble, but only people can change hearts, minds, and politics, and sometimes we refuse to do so. Art is not a silver bullet for corruption. Or slightly more positively, as uh, art study scholar Emily Eliza Scott has said, the job of the artist is to point. So maybe another answer to the question of where do we go from here would be something like lower your expectations for art and raise your expectations for yourself and your community uh, to march, to lobby, to support local journalism, to run for city council, fill fill in the blank. But that sounds a lot like the kind of finger wagging that I have been very much against in my previous work. So at the risk of ending anticlimactically, I will stop there and say thank you very much. And I want to know where you think we should go from here.
Okay, I'm going to start with this one and then we'll pass it around a little bit. Sure. I'm going to ask just a few questions myself of Dr. Seymour, and then we'll open up questions to the audience. And if someone's monitoring the Zoom, we would, oh, great. We'll also um, open it up to some of those questions. So first of all, thank you so much. That really got me thinking. Um, I had a list of questions. I have many more, but I won't be the only one asking. So I'll pick and choose. Um, you really got me thinking about what might happen to comedy as climate change becomes like more and more a part of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And for example, will children's jokes in the future be, why did the chickens swim across the road? That's my but joke. That's my comedy yeah. crisis. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, but really, it is a it is a real question. Like, do you see people bringing this into their off of the internet and into their own kind of comedy and joke habits? Yeah. So I've actually asked my students about this recently because people are claiming that there's this new um, like version of like what what are what are the youth called now? Are they Gen Y? No, they're they're Gen Z. They're Gen Z. Okay. Z. Okay, phew, I had a moment. Um, I'm an elder millennial. Okay. Um, so I, I had heard this thing about um, their, that generation's comedy, and um, it's gotten really dark. Um, so people say things like, oh, I think he's so hot. I want, I want him to run me over with his car. Um, so just really, really grim. This person's nodding. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you, you seem like the right age. Um, yeah. So I think comedy's going to get darker and darker. Um, the Sarah Cooper um, person I mentioned, she has um, a Netflix special called Sarah Cooper colon Everything's Fine, um, and it kind of devolves into hysteria. And if you watch it, the color palette of the film gets darker as it goes on, so you can like barely see things on the screen near the end of it. So it seems like for the moment, comedy is going darker. Um, but again, I think people are innovating. I think they're trying to do something different. And honestly, I feel like um, I truly do want to hear what you guys have to say, because I, I was trying to think of other examples of comedy, like um, doing something that we haven't seen before, right? You know, trying not to just heighten the heighten. And um, I do think Herman, Alison Herman is right that we are at this weird impasse where it's like, you know, uh, seems like the old way of doing things isn't having an effect. And in fact, maybe it, it was doing harm, right? So the John, the um, John Stewart show maybe made us like uh, apolitical or uh, apathetic because we thought we were laughing at his political jokes and that was like doing something. Um, and so, yeah, but for now, it just seems like it's getting darker. But I hope that there's something else that will come up. And again, I want to hear if you guys have ideas. So, yeah. Um, thank you so much. So another question. Here we are in the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. You're the humanities lecturer for the year. Um, when we first started to think and worry about climate change, it was really presented to us as this kind of thing that the scientists knew about and were warning us about. But we've seen a shift recently recognizing this is happening and we need much more from psychology, philosophy, right? Religious studies, <laughs> media studies, right? We need a lot more like kind of broad help, obviously political science. So what do you think um, the humanities and social sciences can do what's the role now of our college, for example? Um, yeah, so I'm I'm from an area called environmental humanities, um, and one of the big claims of that field is people's ideas around the environment are shaped by media, they're shaped by culture, they're shaped by religion, they're not shaped by data. No one is reading the IPCC report for fun, um, or if you are, um, there's something wrong with you. I don't know, um, but just kidding. Um, yeah, so the way that we encounter, we also talked about this in in the class I taught earlier today, um, that at one point there was um, a, a, a poll that showed that the majority of young people were getting their news from the daily show and shows like that. Um, so people want their news with a dash of entertainment for better or worse. And I think we have to recognize that. And again, not assume that people are going to um, go out, you know, the scientists are giving us the data that we need. Um, but how are we actually getting to that data? I think there's, um, you know, many different ways that we can get to that data. And um, just, you know, sort of what I was um, showing with the examples of kind of queer environmentalism and, um, you know, environmental justice, um, environmentalism, we see that, um, again, issues of race, class, and gender shape how we experience the environment. And those are things that are not just scientific things, those are cultural things, those are issues of representation. So um, I think we need all this stuff, you know, <laughs> um, but the sciences always get the funding, strangely, um, but clearly. <laughs> um, and, and there's been a lot of research about storytelling, you know, that's kind of like a, a hot 
um, topic now, but this idea that um, stories need to be crafted in a way that draws you in, right? You're Again, you're not going to watch a, a climate um, themed movie if you think it's going to be depressing, for example. Um, so yeah, those are the skills that people in the humanities have is how do we craft a good narrative that draws people in and, you know, again, doesn't make them super depressed and like, okay, I give up um, or, um, or doesn't make you think that because you watched that film that you've done something, right? It's good to watch <laughs> films, but that doesn't count as actually um, as political action. So uh, yeah, there's a lot to be done. And um, kind of going along with that, I think um, I definitely wouldn't want to say like humor is the only way to go. So just as we can't just have science um, and we also need English and gender studies and, and um, so forth, um, we, you know, I do think there's a place for the seriousness, but we need, we need like a palette of <laughs> many different approaches and many different types of, of knowledge. You know, when you were talking about the online nature of this kind of developing comedic um, communication and the memes and mm -hmm. that it's both liberal and conservative, I was wondering about the kind of monetization of clicks and the way all that works and yeah. wondering if you have a sense of how this kind of the in, what what counts as engagement, right, yeah. is what makes you money. And so how is the kind of economics of social media. And I don't know if this might not be your mm. area of interest, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how maybe the economics of social media is also kind of driving mm -hmm. the way comedy is developing in this way. I mean, it's definitely driving um, the way that we get news, right? Because again, things that we wouldn't have considered newsworthy before, uh, we will share. So things that um, would have been distasteful, I should back up and say I, I do a little bit of um, media history. And so there was something called the Fairness Doctrine, if people remember this, that um, was repealed in, I think, the late 1980s. And the idea before that was... Um, uh, things shouldn't be too ideologically extreme, right? If you're going to have a, a TV, a, a news program, it should, I don't want to say like all sides, you know, because that's problematic too, but it shouldn't be extreme in one direction or the other. And um, Republicans actually uh, were afraid of the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine because they thought people would just be trouncing on Republicans on news shows. And then they came around to it very quickly because they realized that it could actually benefit them. I'm rambling. I promise I'll come back to the, <laughs> what I was saying. Um, and then you get the rise of conservative talk radio, which becomes, you know, very ideologically extreme. Um, so yeah, I think um, a lot of uh, the developments are happening because of yeah, definitely economics, right? So if you can get more eyeballs on something, obviously you're gonna you're gonna share something that's ideologically extreme, even if you are a liberal news source, right? You're gonna say, look at what this horrible racist cartoon, right? You're still gonna post it because you know you're gonna get the clicks. Also, we no longer like to fund journalism in America. We don't like to buy newspapers anymore. I am guilty of that as well. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of a mess. I'm trying to think of a way I can end this <laughs> answer positively. Um, yeah, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to open it up to folks in the audience who has a question for Dr. Seymour. Nancy, are you raising your hand? Okay. Okay. That's okay. Here. Uh, I mean, I just keep thinking about, you know, whether the question of uh, getting the communications right, whether it's through comedy and satire or through serious and earnest messaging is really beside the point mm -hmm. politically, because mm -hmm. the environmentalist movement has for 25 years been criticizing itself from within mm -hmm. about getting the messaging wrong. And the idea is that it's been too doom and gloom and that's mm -hmm. not getting enough people involved. And if we don't get enough people involved, we won't change the politics. But uh the environmental movement in the US has been ro a robust social movement industry for more than 25 years mm -hmm. with tons and tons, a huge array of organizations. And it's just lost the political battle to corporations mm -hmm. and corporations beholden to our political system, campaign mm -hmm. finance and so forth. And it just seems like, why do we, in this area with environmentalism, we're so self-critical mm -hmm. and critical that environmentalists are doing it wrong. Yeah. And if we did it differently, more people would be involved. 2019 was the peak, peak uh, street activism mm -hmm. for global environmentalism. And it doesn't matter because the right has been winning. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how funny we are. Like, I think there should be a whole spectrum of communications around it. And the more humor and satire and stuff, the better. But I just wonder if it isn't, if, it, if that mm -hmm. isn't, that critique isn't kind of underlied by a premise that 
if that is a false premise that if we just get the messaging right yeah. and there's that whole center at Yale about that's just communication environmental mm -hmm. communications messaging mm -hmm. but then somehow we'll mobilize people into the streets but they've mm -hmm. been mobilized yeah. young people have been mobilized for the last you know seven years robustly yeah. globally and it doesn't matter yeah. like nothing and so a huge social movement industry young people in the streets young people begging their parents to deal with it so I guess I'm just wondering like isn't the question maybe more like I love all this work and I think it's super rich but I just wonder about if it doesn't just come down to political strategy and how you beat a system that is fundamentally just a corporate system that no mm -hmm. no amount of messaging and uh individual you know Caring can, yeah. can shift because even the opinion, opinion polls, like people know climate change is happening mm -hmm. even right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I have a million things to say. Um, yeah. So I, I, I do, I agree with you that, um, the question of what would be the right message or what would be the right way to do this. I do think it's beside the point. And I think that's why, um, I kind of end up on the side of, um, thinking of what are the other capacities for art besides, educating right because we know that people are either they are educated or if they're not educated they don't want to be educated so i agree that that's um that's that I, I i'm not really interested in that question either like what is the right thing um i guess what i'm more interested in this idea yeah so i am interested in these other possibilities like catharsis right so in the face of this sort of intractable structural situation what do we produce, right? Um, and sometimes it's just like this primal scream of like, you know, it is just evidence of the fact that, <laughs> that there's so much road blocking. Um, to the question of, and, and, and yeah, I also think that I talk about in the book that there's this idea called the knowledge deficit hypothesis, which I forget who actually came up with that, but it's a really basic idea um, that like, if people just knew about X, they would do something, right? If they just knew about, um, you know, where their clothes were being made or under what conditions they would do something, or if they just knew about climate change, they would do something. And that's um, does not seem to be true. Um, but I think a lot of environmental art does still, and I am going to be critical of this, does still proceed with that idea in mind, right? That the people are, there's just a gap in knowledge and they don't talk about this idea of like, what is <laughs> preventing the change? Yeah. So I'm, I'm with you on that as well. Um, so the question of why are we so self-critical? This is what we like to do. It's like, I don't know, feminists and, um, humanists and, uh, liberals, um, right. We like to, we believe in accountability and we believe yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I think it does go back to this. Um, and again, like I'm targeting mainstream environmentalism here. And like, I like that you said, sort of like the, did you say the industry, like the sort of lifestyle industry of environmentalism that I think has sold this idea. I mean, there's like a zillion books um, at any bookstore that say like 25 things you can do today to stop, you know, to save the planet or whatever, that it has been reduced to this individual, you know, it's very neoliberal, right? Um, that is something that we can do rather than something that, um, you know, the structure is not, not allowing us to do. Um, and so, yeah, I think that people are self, people are critical of the environmental movement because it has on the mainstream level been pitched as this, this thing that like you could, you could actually make a change if you just, you know, brought your bags or recycle, which we all know, like um, my friend Jenny calls it wish cycling, like recycling doesn't actually work apparently. Um, so, yeah, um, and there's just something I also write about vegan satire. There's there's also something about um, Jenny Price writes about this. I recommend her. she has a book called Stop Saving the Planet. Um, that is kind of like an anti book to these, you know, 25 things you can do. And she she goes all the way back to this idea of like uh, virtue um, as, as sort of like this pur these Puritan ideals of like hard work and virtue. And there's something about um, there's something about environmentalism that taps into people's ideas about being a good or bad person that I think like doesn't work with feminism. Like feminism doesn't seem to be like particularly, con I mean, yes, like don't <laughs> give people equal rights, but I don't, don't think there's this idea of like, uh, should you feel guilty or, you know, I, I just don't think it works the same, but um, I'd have to keep, keep thinking more. So thank you. Okay. We have two Zoom questions. Uh, so the first one is, uh, what about a role for ridicule, a mm -hmm. low but effective form of humor um, should someone just double over with laughter to shame a suggestion? And, and what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, yeah, I maybe have, I'm like, I think Nancy's rubbing off on me right now. I think maybe I, in the past, I would say like ridicule is, um, not good because that's, again, that's the thing that we don't do on, on the left. We don't, um, we're not mean spirited or so we like to think, but I don't know, maybe it's time for ridicule. Maybe it's way past time for ridicule. Um, I am open to the possibility of ridicule. Um, again, I do talk in, in the book about, um, you know, a lot of these, um, people are, um, making fun of themselves, right? So it's not just about making fun of other people. They kind of turn it back on themselves and they, they see themselves as not inviolable and not sort of like the voice of God. Um, but yeah, maybe there, maybe there's, we need to go back to, and, and, and a lot of movements are doing this, right? Go back to old fashioned, like shaming, like just naming and shaming. Um, so I'm open, I'm open to ridicule. <laughs> no. Yes. No, 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 not tonight. Not tonight. <laughs> Our second question is uh, a large part of the far right conservative movement has to do with normalizing corrosive attacks on liberal values. Is there any strain of comedy that attempts to corrode through satire or otherwise ostensible conservative values, in particular superficial Christian values? The Bible contains multiple material to do so. Or is this a third rail people choose not to touch? I think I got it because you need one more time. To it. <laughs> <laughs> a large part of the far right conservative movement has to do with normalizing corrosive attacks on liberal values. Is there any strain of comedy that attempts to corrode through satire or otherwise ostensible conservative values, in particular superficial Christian values? The Bible contains multiple material to do so, or is this a quote unquote third rail people choose not to touch? Um, I don't think it's a third rail. I'm not, I'm, there's not a ton that's jumping to my, my mind, except for a book called My Year of Living Biblically, um, which they actually made into a TV show. I don't know if people remember this, that author's name is AJ something. I can't remember his last name. Um, and I actually taught it many years ago. Um, I, I would say it's like 10 years old, um, where he actually attempts to like follow the rules of the Bible, you know, like don't mix fibers and like the stuff about shellfish that clearly I did not observe because I can't remember it. Um, and, uh, the point of that book, I think is just to show the absurdism, right. Of, of um, uh, the impossibility of being perfect, which kind of goes back to the in environmentalist idea. Um, that's the only one I can think of, though. So I would have to keep thinking. Um, and if anyone else has ideas, let me know. But yeah, that's all I can think of. Yeah. If you can hear me, um, I was really intrigued by your thought that the right doesn't think any of the humor that the left has is funny and mm -hmm. vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering why that is the case. Mm. Uh, is it because maybe that that the essence of humor is even there, there's satire or you're ridiculing or whatever, there is a grain of truth that everybody sees mm. in that piece of humor. Mm. And that's why the other side laughs, because there is some grain of truth. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. And then if that is the case, where that kind of is an essential element of kind of a successful joke, if you will, yeah. uh, that goes uh, uh, widespread, then maybe is that a an evidence of the chasm between the right and the left? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think that's a nice way to say it. Um, yeah, so the introduction to this book, um, let me see if I can grab it real fast. Um, I'm going to kind of want to pass it around. Hold on. So that's the book that's called um, "That's Not Funny," um, and it has some some great um, images that sort of capture um, conservative humor. Um, what was I going to say about that? Um, yeah, I do think there's just this fundamental divide. So uh, the book I mentioned very briefly that's called "Irony and Outrage" um, by Denigal Young. Um, I'm just sort of shocked at the fact that this book got published because it's very unflattering to conservatives, but it's based on empirical evidence where she talks about um, they did a study where um, they gave complex jokes. This is gonna sound horrible. I'm just telling you exactly what the book says. They gave complex jokes to conservatives and liberals. And it turns out that liberals enjoyed complex jokes more, jokes that required you to do like an extra, I'm just reporting the facts guys, sorry. <laughs> just reporting the facts. Um, that, that required you to do sort of like a couple conceptual leaps. Um, and so, and I think I mentioned this idea of like, um, punching down is also something that liberals just don't think is funny, right? They don't think being mean to other people is funny. They don't think talking about criticizing personal appearance is funny. Um, but 
again, I'm just speaking the facts. That's what Donald Trump does, right? He makes fun of um, people's disabilities. He makes fun of um, their hairdos, you know, which, which is rich. Um, he, right. So this idea that, um, yeah, I agree with you that I think there's just some things that people are not primed to think is funny. Fundamentally, they just cannot imagine that there could be something funny about making someone's uh, fun of someone's appearance or that there could be something funny about like the the mermaid thing right that took us like several levels to get to the punchline seems like you all enjoy that but other people don't like doing that right they don't want to do that work for whatever reason so um yeah i mean i don't know if this is the thing to despair of i think like just the general political divide is something to despair about um yeah all i can say is i think you're right <laughs> so yeah. Thanks so much. I'm going to go read two of your books, especially Bad Environmentalism. It seems interesting. Um, I had a question about lip syncing. Mm -hmm. And I think you might have suggested that it, in the case of Sarah Cooper and also the Australians, that it was kind of working off script. And I like your reading of that. Mm -hmm. I was curious, is lip syncing satire? Because I've also think of it as kind of a cathartic experience mm -hmm. or a morale booster, especially thinking of drag queens and, you yeah. know, lip sync for your life. Yeah. So I'm just curious if you talk more about lip syncing and its comedic meanings. Yeah, we wanted to write a little bit more about it. And then we ran um, up against a, a word count limit. Um, but I wanted to almost claim that Sarah Cooper is doing this form of drag. Um, so again, it's racial drag. It's 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 gender drag, right? Um, yeah, and that's why I guess I'm so... Yeah, absolutely. Um, lip syncing is um, a campy thing, right? And and it's sort of the the moments when it doesn't work, right? It's kind of that aesthetic of like uh, sort of like this lowbrow campy aesthetic of like not getting the the lip syncing right. Um, and that's why I just find it so strange. I haven't seen. I don't know of anyone on the right doing that for satirical or other purposes. Um, but again, that's why I think it's so strange that there has been this appropriation of other sort of camp and queer modes by the right, because again, we would think of these things as like not going together. And maybe, maybe that's where we'll um, bridge that partisan divide, right? We all apparently love camp. I don't know, um, in different ways. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I think there's like a, a queer um, draggy element to Sarah Cooper's work for sure. Yes, thank you. I'd like to have you share with us, if you would, please, what motivated you uh, to study humor, as you have done. Uh, psychologists have done numerous studies, that, as you well know, that humor enhances healing mm -hmm. and health, longevity. Uh, Why you chose humor, uh, particularly around all these very serious issues mm -hmm. that certainly are confronting America today and the world. Thank you. Um, I blame the Catholic Church um, because I was, I'm completely serious. Um, I was raised going to church and my brother and I, he's a year apart from me. There would always just be this moment where he would laugh at something and then, you know, like the giggles get contagious and then you're trying to keep it in. So I've always been sort of attracted to this idea of um, the inappropriate and sort of like the potential power of that, right? Moments where you're not supposed to laugh and you do, moments where you're supposed to perform and, or behave or, you know, uh, maintain a certain code and then you don't. So that's just kind of my personality. Um, but I've also, you know, I've always been politically engaged and, you know, involved in feminism and, um, and environmentalism since I was young. And um, I think I also, I get, um, and maybe this kind of goes back to Nancy's question, I personally get um, when I feel that I'm being emotionally manipulated, um, by like sentimentality in particular, I get very angry for some reason. <laughs> um, and so just thinking about like, I don't know, those, um, ASPCA commercials where it shows, you know, like the, 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 <laughs> the sad little dog. So I always cry and then I get mad because I feel like it's, it's, it's somehow manipulating me on this sort of like base unfair level. Right. Maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe I am like, the kind of person that Donegal Young talks about, where it's like, I like the, the, the I like to be touched up here, not like, <laughs> you know, like on my um, baser sort of emotions. But um, yeah, so I think I've always been sort of turned off um, by that sort of messaging or those sorts of um, um, attempts to um, get messages across. And yeah, and I actually, um, I did this um, conference thing where I was getting into eco media studies and um, I did like a pre-conference workshop where we had to watch like the 10 most recent environmental documentaries and they were all kind of doing this sentimentality thing and I just thought there's got to be something else out there and then I started looking for it and, and found it so yeah thank you any other questions 
Okay, well, I want to just say on behalf of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and I forgot to give a plug earlier that uh, it was the elected faculty committee of the college that put uh, your name up for the nomination. Thank you. And so uh, some, some of those folks were here as well. Um, we all want to thank you for coming and thank all of you, our cause community, for joining us tonight. Uh, there still are some other events coming up as part of Earth Week. So please uh, log in and look at the calendar because I don't have my notes to read them to you. But thank you so much. And please let's give a warm thanks uh, to Dr. Nicole Seymour. <laughs>